Hello uh, and welcome to a new module, interlaminar stresses in, uh, in laminates. Uh, today is the first lecture. So, in our last module, we have discussed the macro mechanics of laminates, wherein actually we have uh, discussed in details the classical lamination theory and uh, how to obtain ABVD matrix from classical lamination theory for a laminate. And uh, based on ABVD matrix, we have discussed uh, special cases of uh, you know laminate stiffnesses and different types of laminates, like what are the importance of symmetric laminate, anti-symmetric laminate, quasi-isotropic laminate, and then. We also uh, discussed how to determine the stresses and strains in each ply of a laminate. Okay, uh, and from those stresses and strains in each ply, we we have seen how to apply appropriate failure theories to determine the ply failure, and then to determine the laminate failure. When the first ply fail, the load at which the first ply fails is the first ply failure load, and then we have seen how to obtain the successive failure of the plies, which is called the progressive ply failure till the last ply fails, which is called the last ply failure load or the laminate failure load. We have also understood the strength of laminate uh, uh, subjected to mechanical or thermal or hygroscopic load or a combination of thermo hydro mechanical loading. Okay. So, while discussing uh, classical lamination theory, uh, we have seen that it is a simple theory, but wherein actually the stresses are considered to be only in plane in each lamina. Okay? That means, if you remember that if we consider a laminate and we try to find out the stresses in the lamina, in classical lamination theory, one of the key assumptions is that each lamina of the laminate is subjected to only in plane stresses. Okay? That means, uh, suppose this is your x with our usual convention y and z. So, if we consider one lamina, the stresses are only sigma x, sigma y and tau x y. That means, we have only considered the in plane stresses okay, and no out of plane stresses. Okay. While this may be true, for uh, thin wall structures with in plane loading, but for a layered laminate, uh, outer plane stresses may be induced from in plane loading. Okay? And it is more so because in a laminate, the adjacent plies may have different uh, thermoelastic properties and that might lead to interlaminar stresses, especially near the free edge. Okay? So, these interlaminar stresses actually uh, lead to separation of adjacent lamina or ply, which is called delamination, which is very, very important at, uh, as it is on the unique mode of failure in laminated composite structures. Therefore, we must understand this interlaminar stresses, which is actually not considered in classical lamination theory. Okay? So, in addition to that, we have seen in classical lamination theory, it does not consider transverse shear. Okay? In our assumptions, we have uh, assume that the transverse shear is neglected because we have considered the interface to be non shear deformable and therefore we uh, we have ignored the transverse shear then also the classical lamination theory if you see it actually does not satisfy the stress boundary condition how is that suppose say for example suppose we have a laminate suppose we have a laminate okay Okay, this laminate is suppose subjected to only say say uniaxial load in this direction. Okay, say it is only subjected to Nx. Only subjected to Nx. So let us consider uh, suppose we consider a laminate which is only subjected to uh, axial load Nx. That means this edges it is subjected to traction. However, if you look at this two edge, these two edges, they are actually free edges. What is free edge? That means, this edge is free from any 
load okay it is not neither it is subjected to any shear or traction load okay now if you consider uh, this laminate and try to analyze using clt try to analyze using classical lamination theory you, you may obtain sigma x sigma y tau xy and suppose this this is the width of the laminate okay since these two edges are free edges therefore at these two edges tau xy must be equal to 0 stress boundary condition similarly sigma y must be equal to 0 because no load is applied however classical lamination theory does not predict that classical lamination theory gives us a value of uh, tau xy sigma y okay which is constant throughout the lamina therefore it does not satisfy the stress boundary condition which is essential for any elasticity problem it must uh, satisfy this so these are some of the limitations of the classical lamination theory however in by uh, using classical lamination theory we have seen that considering the in plane stresses in the lamina we could actually uh, determine the failure of each lamina therefore we could determine the first ply failure load and last ply failure load but it is observed that because of the adjacent plies may have different uh, thermoelastic properties therefore even subjected to in plane loading there may be out of plane stresses especially at the free edges and these out of plane stresses are very very important as far as the design of the laminate is concerned because it leads to a failure mode called delamination which is actually separation of the adjacent plies and therefore due considerations must be given to understand this and to incorporate this in design of laminate structure therefore in this lecture we will try to see what are these interlaminar stresses and uh, the mechanics of uh, development of such interlaminar stresses okay now since we have been uh, discussing uh, on uh, the in plane and outer plane stresses let us try to understand what exactly are the outer plane stresses and in plane stresses uh, with reference to a laminate okay consider this laminate say x y uh, z are the x y z are fixed at the reference plane this is the reference plane okay which is the mid plane of the laminate okay now if you consider a small element of the from the laminate suppose if we consider a small volume element from the laminate suppose we consider a small volume element of the laminate okay now of course this is our x this is a y and this is a z therefore this is sigma x in plane normal stress x y is the in plane therefore sigma x is the in plane normal stress similarly sigma y okay is the in plane another in plane normal stress and shear stress x plane y direction that is tau x y and similarly shear stress y plane x direction that is tau y x but equivalent of cross shear tells us that tau y x equal to tau x y I am not drawing on the other face also similarly there will be stresses on the other face also other faces also okay like similarly there will be sigma y there will be sigma x therefore this sigma x sigma y and tau x y are the in plane stresses okay then what are the outer plane stresses with reference to this uh, coordinate system x y z again in the same small volume at a point we draw this volume and we, we see what are the stresses this is your x this is y and this is z okay 
Okay. So, sigma z is the normal stress which is the outer plane normal stress okay, which is definitely not in the x y plane it is in the, it is perpendicular to the x y plane. Okay. Then we have z plane x direction okay, z plane x direction tau z x or x plane z direction tau x z they are equal for because of equality of cross shear. Similarly, there will be on the opposite faces also. Okay. So, tau x z similarly z plane and y direction this is tau z y okay y plane z direction y plane z direction is uh, this is tau y z okay and z plane y direction is tau z y and this is equal to tau y z because of cross here. Okay. Similarly, on the other faces I have not shown. Therefore, these three stresses sigma z, tau x z and tau y z are out of plane out of plane stresses. Now, try to understand with reference to a laminate what these stresses do. The in plane stresses are responsible for in plane strains, like it could be extension or stretching in that plane, whereas the out of plane stresses, suppose sigma z, if it actually acts at the interface, it will try to separate two adjacent plies. Similarly, tau xz, if it actually acts at an interface, it will try to have relative sliding motion between that relative sliding between two adjacent plies. Okay. So, we can see this suppose we focus our attention between two adjacent plies. Suppose this is one ply, I am just exerting these are the two adjacent plies. Okay. Say this is our x y and z. Now, sigma z if it acts suppose in this direction, it will try to separate the two plies. Okay. This is what it try to tries to do. Similarly, tau x z will try to slide one layer above the other. Okay. Similarly, tau uh, y z this is tau x z this is tau y z this will also try to slide one layer above the other. So, the net effect of this inter uh, I mean this outer plane interlaminar stresses if it acts at the interface are actually to separate tries it they try to separate the two adjacent lamina therefore this this is this leads to what is called delamination and it is important mode of failure which needs to be actually taken into account okay so we understood now what are the in plane and outer plane stresses so there are three outer plane stresses uh, one normal and two shear stresses and the effect of those outer plane stresses when they act at an interface is to separate two adjacent lamina leading to what is known as delamination. Now, let us try to understand why these outer plane stresses do exist. Okay. So, uh, to understand this later we will start with equilibrium equations. Okay. We will try with equilibrium considerations. Okay. Suppose, uh, we have uh, this is a laminate. Okay say this is suppose the width of the laminate is say 2b okay the length of the laminate is say l 
and uh, thickness is h. Okay. This is the reference plate. Okay. Now, from classical Lamentian theory, now from classical Lamentian theory, we get only sigma x, sigma y, tau x y. It does not provide us with other three stresses, outer plane stresses. Okay. However, we know that the stresses induced must satisfy the stress equilibrium equations. Okay. Now, if we consider a laminate, suppose this laminate is subjected to, suppose this laminate is subjected to only n x uniaxial. Okay. Suppose this is subjected to uniaxial load n x, meaning all other forces are not there, even though it is not subjected to any other force or moment. Okay. Since it is uniaxial, uniaxial loading, we may assume that stresses are independent of x in axial loading in along x direction. Therefore, the stresses are independent of x. Okay. Now, Considering stress equilibrium equations, stress equilibrium equations, all of us know what are the stress equilibrium equation. First equation is del sigma x del x plus del tau x y del y plus del tau x z del z is equal to 0 neglecting body force. Okay. In absence of body force, this is the first equilibrium equation. Similarly, the second equilibrium equation is del tau x y del x plus del sigma y del y plus del tau y z del z is equal to 0. And similarly, the third equation is del tau x z del x plus del tau y z del y plus del sigma z del z is equal to 0. Okay. Now, since we have considered a uniaxial load and assume that the stresses are independent of x, therefore, partial derivative with reference to with respect to x could be made 0 and therefore, 1 implies therefore, 1 implies del tau x y del y plus del tau x z del z is equal to 0. Why? Since del sigma x del x is equal to 0. Okay. This gives us del tau x z del z is equal to minus del tau x y del y. Okay. So, we can write this as if we integrate this, then 
tau x z at any z at any z is equal to minus integration of minus h by 2 2 z del tau x y del tau x y del y d z. Okay. So, what we could see is that if uh, the stresses are independent of x therefore, the first term goes to 0 considering the first equilibrium equation. We could see that interlaminar shear stress tau x z at any z will exist provided there is a gradient of tau x y with y. Okay. Suppose, this is our equation number 4. Now, let us try to understand what does this gradient of del tau x y del y I mean gradient of x y with y tau x y with y mean. Okay. Now, if this is non-zero del tau x y del y is non-zero then there will be tau x z. If del tau x y del y is 0 there will be no tau x z. Okay. Now, let us try to understand in this laminate suppose we, we find out what is tau x y in any lamina at a, at a particular lamina at, at a distance of z we find out what is tau x y. We can find out okay. we can find out what is tau x y. Okay. So, the given lamina we can find out what is tau x y. So, we know tau x y at a given lamina which is at a distance of z say. Okay. This lamina is at a distance of z from the reference plane. Now, whatever is the value of tau, tau x y because this surface because these two surfaces are free surfaces or free edges these two a, sorry these two edges are free edges not surface these two edges are actually free edges it means tau x y at those edges must be 0 that is what is the stress boundary condition because the no, no load is applied at those edges. Therefore, tau x y at y is equal to y is equal to plus minus b is equal to 0. See this is the free edge. these are the free edges. Okay. Therefore, whatever is the value of tau x y in a particular lamina it must be 0 at that at those two edges. Now, suppose we suppose we find out using classical lamination theory what is tau x y and try to plot tau x y as a function of y at a particular lamina. Okay. Suppose this is our y and we plot tau x y. Okay. So, this is our b and this is our minus b. Suppose we calculate tau x y from classical lamination theory and of course, it is constant. Now, whatever is this value tau x y must be 0 at y is equal to b and y is equal to minus b. Therefore, it must drop down to 0 at the at the two free edges. Okay. Okay, this is what the variation is. Even though classical lamination theory does not tell us, uh, I mean it does not satisfy the stress boundary condition, but uh, we know that the tau x y has to be 0 at y is equal to plus minus b. Therefore, 
it drops down to 0. Now, if you look at this, at this region, how, how it is, I mean, it, it may be linear, it may be quadratic, it may be exponential, how it drops down to 0 is not important at this point of time. But that means there is a del tau x y del y at this region. Okay? That means, near the free edge, there is a gradient of tau x y with respect to y, same is true here. Now, we have seen from equation 4 that if this delta x y del y is not 0, that leads to existence of tau x j. X z, okay? Therefore, even though there is no tau x z here, because at this region there is a del tau x y del y, therefore, there is tau x z as a function of z. Okay? So, this is precisely the reason why at the free edge there will be tau x z. That means, why there will be out of plane shear stress tau x z at the free edge. The reason is because there exists a del tau x y del y. Now, to, for del tau x y del y to exist, there must be tau x y. If tau x y itself is not there, then that del tau x y del y is not there. Suppose there is a tau x y, whatever is this value? at the free edge it must go to, to it, it goes to 0 therefore there is a steep gradient and because of this there is tau x z so this is uh, how we get convinced mathematically we can show that at the free edge there will be tau x z okay similarly here also similarly here also because there is uh, del tau x y del y non zero therefore there will be a tau x z okay so now let us see the second equation Okay. So, second equilibrium equation implies again we neglect the that the stresses are independent of x therefore, derivative with respect to x will be 0. So, it will be del sigma y del y plus del tau y z del z is equal to 0 this means del tau y z del z is equal to minus del sigma y del y. If we integrate this, we can write del tau uh, sorry tau y z at a particular z is equal to integration of minus h by 2 2 z del sigma y del y dz. This is our equation number 5. That means, if there exists a gradient of sigma y with respect to y, if this is non-zero, that leads to tau y z at a particular z. Now, let us try to understand what this del tau y z del y means. Again, for the for a given laminate, we can find out from uh, that uh, what is sigma y. Okay? And if we try to plot sigma y, if we try to plot sigma y as a function of y, okay? So, from classical lamination theory, if we try to see that, so this is sigma y, this is constant, okay. But we know that the two free edges at y is equal to plus b and minus b must be free from stresses because they are free edges, they must satisfy the stress boundary condition. Therefore, at y is equal to b as well as at y is equal to minus b. sigma y must be equal to 0. Okay? So, that means, at this region near the free edge, there is a non-zero stress gradient del sigma y del y. 
and equation 5 tells us if there is del sigma y del y which is non zero that leads to tau yz therefore there will be tau yz okay similarly here also there is non zero del sigma y del y and therefore there will be tau yz so at the two free edges there will be interlaminar shear stress tau yz because and why tau yz will be there because if there is a non zero del sigma y del y then there will be tau yz now for that there should be sigma y if there is no sigma y question of del sigma y del y doesn't come so there is a, a sigma y but at the free edge sigma y drops down to zero therefore there is a gradient okay so we can see that at this region there is del sigma y del y not equal to 0 but away from that this is 0 therefore away from free edge there is no uh, tau y z but near the free edge where there is a steep gradient of del sigma y del y there is tau y z same was the case with sigma z also here uh, I mean tau x z because here del tau x y del y is equal to 0, but at this del tau x j y del y was non 0 therefore, there is a tau x z. So, near the free edge there are interlaminar shear stresses because there are stress gradient of del tau x y del y or del sigma y del y exists away from that because there is no stress gradient therefore, there is no interlaminar shear stress that is these are the free edge uh, interlaminar stresses. Okay. So, now let us uh, turn to equation number 3, third equilibrium equation. There again we make the uh, del tau x z del x 0 because no variation of stresses with x. Therefore, we write the other two terms that is del tau y z del y plus del sigma z del z is equal to 0. Therefore, del sigma z del z is equal to minus del tau y z del y. If we integrate this, then sigma z at any z is equal to minus integration of going from minus h by 2 to z del tau y z del y dz equation number 6. Now, this equation tells us that if there is a non zero del tau y z del y that will lead to a sigma z value. Now, what is del tau z del tau y z del y we have already seen that in this region okay there is a in this region there is a del tau y z del y because tau y z increases from 0 to maximum value in this region why tau y z is there because there was del tau uh, del sigma y del y therefore we can see that in this region del tau y z del y exist therefore, that leads to a sigma z. So, we could now understand from the equilibrium equation considering equilibrium equations we could understand that uh, why three interlaminar stresses one normal stress and two interlaminar uh, I mean shear stress why three out of plane stresses will be induced at the free edge. Okay. Now, what are the reasons number one tau x z is induced because of the existence of del tau x y del y. Okay. We have seen that here. Then tau y z is induced because of the existence of del sigma y del y. Okay. Then sigma z is induced because of the existence of 
tau y z del tau y z del y. Therefore, out of plane stresses at the free edges tau x z is due to existence of del tau x y del y. Now, for that there should be non zero tau x y. Similarly, out of plane shear stress tau y z is induced because of existence of del sigma y del y and that will be there only when sigma y is there. Okay. Similarly, sigma z which is the out of plane normal stress is due to the presence of del tau y z del y and that is again due to del sigma y del y and therefore, again for that sigma y should be there. Okay. So, these are the three interlaminar normal stress or three out of uh, sorry three interlaminar stresses that means, out of plane uh, two shear stresses one normal stresses one normal stress these two are the interlaminar out of plane shear and this is normal. and they are actually responsible for okay, delamination. Suppose uh, we just uh, show little, suppose we have two adjacent plies okay suppose this is the free edge so say this is our x this is y and this is z say okay so suppose sigma z is positive Suppose at the free edge there is sigma z, that means it will try to separate two lamina. On the other hand, if sigma z is negative, it does not have any effect in on delamination. Okay. Then this tau x z, this also try to shear two adjacent lamina, that means try to slide one lamina over the other. Okay. Uh, similarly, this tau y z this also tries to slide one layer over the other, but in the other direction okay. one is in the x direction another is in the y direction. Okay. So, having understood that why these interlaminar stresses are actually induced now let us see that uh, how this actually happens. Okay. Let us see that mathematically we are convinced that interlaminar stresses are actually induced. Now, suppose we consider a so you consider a an angle lamina. Okay. I am just showing uh, two adjacent lamina. Suppose this is a uh, we consider a plus minus theta, say consider an angle lamina. Okay. Uh, suppose consider a plus minus plus minus theta symmetric lamina and subjected to only 
n x. Okay, this is say x. This is y. Okay, this is the plus minus theta. So it is only subjected to n x. Fine. Therefore, for this lamina, we can for this laminate, we can obtain a B B D matrix. Now, because it is symmetric laminate, subjected to only in plane load, we can relate the axial. I mean, we can relate the in plane force to the in plane strains. Okay, therefore, epsilon not x. Epsilon not y, gamma x y not is equal to a one one, a one two, a two six. Inverse only an x, others are zero because it is symmetric. We could decouple that. Okay. Okay. Now from this, we can actually find out if it is subjected to an x. There definitely there will be epsilon x. There will be also epsilon y. Okay. So there will be epsilon. X not, I think uh, I have. Uh, epsilon x not, epsilon y not, gamma x y not. Therefore, there will be epsilon x not. Okay, there will be epsilon y not. Okay, there will be. Gamma x y not because it's a uh, balanced laminate. Okay, uh, so there will not be any gamma x y not because it's plus minus theta symmetric. Now, let us see that this is what we get. Okay, so now we can find out the stresses in each lamina. We can find out. The stresses in each lamina. How? Now that we have strains, this strain will be the strain in all the layers. Okay, these are the strains in all the lamina because there is no curvature. Because there is no curvature. Okay. Now from these strains, we can find out the stresses in each lamina. Okay. How we can find out the stresses sigma x, sigma y, tau x y in each lamina by multiplying the strain with the corresponding reduced transform. Stiffness matrix for that lamina. Okay, and what we'll get is that I'm just writing it. You can you, we have done it number of times. Say, therefore, there will be of course a normal stress in plus theta and minus theta, and they will be equal. There will be normal stress in the y direction also. Okay, there will be. I mean, there will be no normal stress in the y direction. Okay, and there will be shear stress.
there will be shear stress in both the layers. But you can see that they are actually opposite in sign. This will be positive, then this will be negative. Okay. Even though uh, there is no mid surface shear strain, but there will be shear stresses in each plus theta and minus theta layer. Why? Because for each plus theta and minus theta layer, you can see that Q bar matrix will have Q16, Q26 terms. Okay. Therefore, because of this uh, normal, uh, even though the there is uh, mid surface uh, shear strain is 0, but uh, in each layer there will be uh, shear stresses. Okay. In each layer there will be shear stresses corresponding to the normal strains. Okay. So, what we get is that uh, we get that there is tau x y. What is why we have taken this is just to show that even though this laminate is subjected to only n x that leads to because it is plus minus theta symmetric that leads to tau x y in plus theta and tau x y in minus theta. Okay. Now, because there is tau x y, therefore, at the free edges tau x y has to drop down to 0, therefore, there will be tau x z. Okay. So, therefore, there will be tau x z will be induced. Okay. Therefore, there will be tau x z will be induced. Now, we can see that uh, why tau x y is actually developed. You see, why tau x y is developed because it is an angle lamina, one is plus theta, another is minus theta. And because there is tau x y, therefore, there will be gradient like if you plot now. So, suppose this is your tau x y, okay. therefore, there will be del tau x y del y, this is b. Okay. So, there will be tau x z. Okay. Now, why this tau x y, non-zero tau x y is developed? Because there is a, you know, because there is a shear ex extension coupling. This is due to existence of shear extension coupling in plus theta and minus theta layers and they are actually opposite. Okay. If you see that shear extension coupling, uh, if you see the shear extension coupling of plus theta is actually opposite to the that in minus theta. Okay. Therefore, there is a difference in shear extension coupling okay. and this difference in responsible for tau x z. We have two adjacent layers and for two adjacent layers plus theta and minus theta, there is a difference in the shear extension coupling and because of this at the interface, the interlaminar shear stress tau x z is developed. Okay. Now, let us see, uh, but you see in this case, there is no 
sigma y. We have subjected this to n x, but there is no sigma y. Since there is no sigma y, therefore there is no uh, del sigma y del y, and therefore there is no tau y z. Okay. So let us take another case where there will be sigma y. Okay. Let us take a second case. Suppose we take a cross ply laminate, zero ninety symmetric laminate, subjected to n x. Okay. So, this is a 0 90 symmetric laminate which is subjected to Nx. Okay. Only subjected to Nx. Fine. Now, what happens if we have a 0 90 symmetric laminate subjected to Nx? Similarly, we can find out that uh, what are the mid surface strains and curvature. We can Calculate the mid surface strains and curvatures, okay. A one one, A one two, actually for zero ninety symmetric laminate A one six, A two six will be zero, okay. I am just writing for the sake of so this is N X zero zero, okay. So, this leads to actually this will be 0, this will be 0, this will be 0. Okay. Therefore, this leads to epsilon x naught of course will be there and similarly epsilon y naught will also be there, okay. but there is no gamma, there is no shear strain. And from this we can calculate and again these mid surface strains will be the strains in all the layers. This will be because we have considered a considered a symmetric laminate strains in all the lamina. So, from this we can calculate the stresses in the in all the lamina okay how we can find out the stresses by multiplying the strains with the reduced transform stiffness matrix Okay. Of course, gamma x y is 0 here, but I have just written for the sake of completeness. Therefore, and that will lead to you know that will lead to sigma x will be of course, there for 0 degree layer okay. and uh, sigma x will also be there for 90 degree layer. Sigma y will be there for zero degree layer. But this will be positive, and sigma y will also be there for ninety degree layer, but this will be negative, and there is no tau x y of course for zero degree as well as for ninety degree. There is no because it is specially orthotropic laminate. Each ply is a specially orthotropic ply. Therefore, okay. Now it is subjected to n x. Why there is sigma y? Because you will you appreciate that uh, this is zero degree ply, and this is ninety degree ply. Again, this is zero degree ply, and this is ninety degree ply. 
So, if you consider this 0 degree ply, suppose this is 0 degree and this is the adjacent 90 degree. Okay. Now, when they are loaded along x, because of the portions ratio, there will be contraction in the y direction. This contraction in the y direction for the 0 degree layer and for the 90 degree layers are different because the portions ratios are different. You will appreciate that nu x y for 0 degree is not equal to nu x y for 90 degree. In fact, nu x y for 0 degree is equal to nu y x for 90 degree. Anyway, they are not equal. Okay? And because they are not equal, therefore, they are not allowed to contract by the same amount in the lateral direction and that leads to existence of sigma y. Okay? Therefore, sigma y is there. Okay? Now, because sigma y is there, now if you plot sigma y versus y, therefore, at the free edges it must go to 0. So, therefore, del sigma y del y exists here and because of this there will be tau y z. Okay. Now, therefore, what is the reason for existence of sigma y? Because of the portions ratio mismatch and because sigma y exists therefore, there is del sigma y del y and therefore, there is tau y z. So, the tau y z is due to the mismatch in poison ratio of adjacent plies. Okay? So, you understood from equilibrium equations that why tau x z and tau y z are developed. We also understood physically what are the reasons. Tau x z is because of the uh, mismatch in the shear extension to coupling coefficient and tau y z is because of the mismatch of the Poisson's ratio. And similarly, because this exists, therefore, del tau y z exists that leads to existence of sigma z. So, sigma z is also due to mismatch in Poisson's ratio of adjacent plies. So, we understood the mathematically we understood the reasons why there will be interlaminar uh, why there will be out of plane stresses at the free edge of a laminate and we also understood or we try to attribute the reasons why they actually are induced. One uh, tau x z is induced because of the mismatch in shear extension coupling coefficient and tau y z and sigma z are induced because of the mismatch of mismatch in portion ratio of the adjacent laminate okay? and they are they are at the free edge. Okay? If it is not free edge, then at that edge, the stresses will not uh, drop down to zero. Okay, so it is there in the free edge. Now, uh, free edge may not be always at the at the edges of the laminate. Suppose you have a laminate. I can show some of the free edges. Suppose you have a laminate where there is a hole
this is also a free edge. A edge, an edge which is free, which is not uh, subjected to any load or traction. Okay. So, suppose this is subjected to suppose this is your x, this is your y, this is your z. So, if it is only subjected to suppose n x, therefore, this are anywhere with the free edges. In addition, suppose there is a hole, this is also this also forms a free edge. So, this phenomenon of interlaminar development of interlaminar outer plane stresses will also be seen at this free edge of the hole, free edges of the hole along with the uh, free edges of the, the this free edges. Okay. Therefore, now we have uh, for the sake of explanation, we have taken an angle laminate. and we have shown that how tau x z is developed. We have taken a cross ply laminate and we have shown how tau y z and sigma z are developed. Now, for any general laminate, all these three stresses may be be there at the free edge. Say for example, say 0 maybe theta 1, 90, theta 2, symmetric may not be symmetric also. Okay. So, at each interface, so between 0 and theta, there will be uh, between theta 1 and 90 between 90 and theta 2 there will be interlaminar stresses. Okay. So, at all this there will be interlaminar stresses tau x z, shear stresses tau x z and tau y z and normal stress sigma z. Okay. So, depending upon what are the, what is the magnitude of uh, these interlaminar stresses delamination will initiate at a particular interface therefore it is very very important to understand how the uh, interlaminar stresses are induced and uh, which might lead to the failure of the laminate and also it is since it is decided by the stacking sequence because at a particular interface between two lamina adjacent lamina whether interlaminar stresses will be there or not if it is there what will the magnitude is actually decided by the stacking sequence. Therefore, by changing the stacking sequence, we can change the interlaminar stresses. Say, for example, if sigma z is negative, and for another stacking sequence, for a stacking sequence and for another stacking sequence suppose sigma z is positive so we'll prefer this sorry sorry we'll 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 prefer the negative sigma z because positive sigma z is actually it leads to delamination whereas negative sigma z does not have any influence on the delamination. Okay. So, it is important to understand the influence of stacking sequence on the uh, these interlaminar stresses which are responsible for delamination. Okay. So, thank you, I will stop here today.